Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Aaron Watson. Aaron is a co-founder of Piper Creative, which is a video content creation company right here in Pittsburgh, and they have customers all over the U.S. Aaron, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me, Spencer. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for coming on. I'm excited to have you. Yeah, it's, um, it's always fun having somebody else on who's passionate about podcasts. Usually I am the most podcasted person uh, in the studio, and I feel like that's not the case today. So it's good to have, uh, you know, the ability to be schooled here by someone that does this professionally. Yeah, and it's uh, it's an ongoing process. And, and what we usually say to clients is you have the esteemed benefit of being with someone who's made, you know, mistakes and errors and all sorts of <laughs> stumbles for 500 plus episodes. And so hopefully I can help you shortcut at least a dozen of them, hopefully more. Nice. Yeah, that's, that's what you get paid for. Um, I kind of say that too in the contract engineering business, right? Which is like, I've fucked up a lot and yeah. that's why you're paying me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so. And that's the thing, like, you know, when, when you start off in any business, it, it, it's really hard to appreciate the compounding of knowledge and wisdom that comes with just being in the game for longer than most of your competitors and the value that your clients are going to derive from that. Like, I'm sure, you know, just the fact that you've seen all the problems or like even at, at like a, you know, a more accessible level, like you don't pay the plumber for how long it took him to fix, you know, the water that is spraying all over your house. You pay him because you desperately need that solved and he <laughs> has the experience to know exactly what to do in a very short period of time. And, you know, plumbing businesses are very good business. Oh, yeah. No, I, I knew a plumber when I was in grad school. Um, I was living in an apartment and me and my uh, buddies thought we would plumb in a dishwasher in my, my cheap apartment I had at the time. And uh, we twisted a cast iron pipe and we caused a waterfall to go into the basement. Oh, God. <laughs> I called up my landlord to panic. I'm like, hey, I need a plumber. Help. And he's like, you fucking idiot. <laughs> so, anyway, um, we got this plumber to come and he drove a Maserati <laughs> to, the, yeah. to the job. Yeah, I mean, because that's, that's the thing is always like, how bad is the need? Whatever your offer is, whatever whatever industry you're in, like, is the offer so bad that you will pay more or less any price for speed? Like that that commands a ton of yeah. pricing power. Well, it's even if you're charging like a thousand dollars an hour. I mean, if it only takes you fifteen minutes to take you know do something that would take someone else eight hours, yeah, maybe it's worth it. Yeah. You know, it's, or the uh, analogy that they always use with the plumber is if if you've got a party, like you've got your like daughter's birthday party at 4 p.m. and the whatever the you know toilet explodes at 1 p.m. like you'll pay whatever to like clean up your house and have it be functional for that yeah. party like it's it's not price is not the first thing that you're optimizing for when you make that buying decision. so plumbing is price inelastic way less uh price elastic than most other services so I always confuse that. Is it more elastic or less elastic? Inel it's it's less elastic it's okay. not as inelastic as like Heroin. high <laughs> heroin i was gonna go other medications but yes uh certain ingestibles for for folks with different things that they're trying to satiate uh and then at the other end of the spectrum you, there's a lot of services out there that are commoditized yep. and yeah, sure. i would argue increasingly so whether it's because of software or because of globalization of or just increased white competitiveness Sorry, yeah what, yeah opinion. exactly the, the the increasing competition that comes with remote work is going to lead to a lot more commoditization of services that you know, at least for the last century, people have thought they were pretty darn secure. In. So what are some of the jobs that you've kind of noticed going that way just only recently? So I, I think, you know, in the micro, it's any sort of administrative task, like, yeah. like the ability to hire someone who is in a completely different cost of living realm yep. that still speaks fluent English, that is willing to work hard, that has experience and can be, you know, offloaded certain administrative tasks is is available right now here in the present whether or not you're utilizing it yeah but the scarier harsher truth is that for the folks that aren't outsized performers absolute experts in you know complex robotics engineering uh you know the highest end of mergers and acquisitions and, and these other type of like complex intellectual tasks anyone that isn't on that outlier the, the people in the middle are at real risk and i, I heard it said once and i I honestly, I probably think about this, if not every day, every other day, Spencer. Sure. What globalization did to blue collar work, remote work will do to white collar work. And to, to make that more plain for the, yeah, I'm sure most people understand what's being said there, but 
you know, globalization meant that all of the factories and manufacturing and physical tasks that had historically been done in the United States were sent out to all these other countries. Yep. And now we're seeing, you know, reshoring of all this stuff as people get worried about, you know, geopolitical conflict and whatnot. But it's a different set of risks and, and things you're working against, right? I mean, now you've got to deal with customs and shipping times and volatility of Right. But as soon as everyone politics, <laughs> as soon as everyone receded from the office into a Zoom room, and in, into some sort of telecommunications yep. and Slack and, you know, project management software, you became way more fungible with people in all sorts of different places that have way lower costs of living. And that's that's, that's a, interesting. a hard thing for a lot of people to appreciate because that hasn't been the case up until candidly like 2015. Um, and, and very poignantly 2020. Yeah, for sure. And so that is something that I see. I see it across the board. I, you know, there's a, a new company, Oceans, uh, that uh, the co-founder of The Morning Brew uh, in, invested in. Oh, interesting. And he was talking about it and he said, you know, they're hiring talent in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka's, I, I don't know the exact number, but it's like as bottom of the cost of living barrel as you can find. And yet... In the capital of Sri Lanka, Colombo, they have a Deloitte, a KPMG, and one of the other big financial firms. Oh, interesting. And so they're doing... Well, and those people are probably making great money by Sri Lankan standards, I would think. Spectacular money by Sri Lankan standards, but an amazing deal for Deloitte. if you're serving a Fortune 500, a Fortune 1000 client and doing their audit. Yeah, that's pretty So, it, you know, whatever that billable hour uh, difference is, is probably, you know, mouthwatering. And, yep. you know... They have all this, the, the training to, to meet the KPMG and Deloitte standards. They're uh, a former English colony, so they have the English schooling system. So you're not having issues with, you know, the capacity to communicate in the language of business, which yep. is English. And it's like, what do, what do you do if you're the person like who... Cantonese is on the rise. It, it, it's on the rise, but what, if you, what do you do if you're the person that just kind of coasted through an accounting degree and doesn't really care about it and is going to try to, like, you know, just you know, check in, check out, barely do any work. Like your lunch is going to get eaten by someone who is going to work their butt off for like a best in the neighborhood type of salary. So it, it's something people need to be aware of. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Do you think the uh, counter is just to move to a cheaper place to work harder? Some combination of both? I think it depends on where you are. I think that the thing that will always be a differentiator is a differentiated skill set and or work ethic because the work ethic gives yeah, way sure. to the skill set, right? Like your love of engineering and, 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 and robotics seeded your ability to solve really interesting problems for your clients. And outperform my competitors. Yeah, but similarly, I'm sure that, you know, your love of content creation allowed you to create a unique product that people are willing to pay a premium for. Right, my, my differentiated, you know, selling point is you can you know, go to three other providers and be like, I've actually built the audience on YouTube. I've actually produced hundreds of podcasts myself. We've actually produced thousands of podcasts for clients. And we know what we're doing. And, and it's demonstrable. Like that's, that's what someone's buying. They're buying the peace of mind that comes from that. That's B2B sales in general. They're yeah. buying, you know, people don't get fired for hiring IBM. People want to buy the things that don't get them fired or the things that, you know, make them feel secure yeah. in the purchase that they just made in a B2B context. Yeah, for sure. That's interesting because, I mean, you're definitely not wrong. Um, and it does, I think there's a lot of startups that are frustrated by that fact because, you know, you have this innovative product or whatever, a different way of doing things, but it's risky as hell from the perspective of a purchasing agent. Yeah, <laughs> so. exactly. And, 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 and it's, that's what they want. They want the security. And even at like the highest levels, they'll talk about, like I was listening to a, a SaaS founder talk about like, oh, once we IPO'd, then like, all these contracts are coming our way because that was the barometer. Oh, now you're a publicly traded company. Now you're of that level. And that's a certain like high end enterprise sale where that's the consideration. That's but like interesting. you're always climbing that scale of legitimacy. And you, you, some would argue that's brand. Some would argue that's actual like experience and therefore skill set. Yeah. But if folks. Probably a combination of both to yeah. some extent. I mean, you can have a super junior person that you know, a publicly traded company that's, you know, and you can have a super senior person at a startup nobody knows about. For sure, without yeah. question. But to, to better answer your question of like what people can do, you need to think about what the highest leverage things are for you to push on. And for some people that means 
getting a virtual assistant or getting that admin to just help you with the low level stuff yeah. so that you can spend more time compounding on the high leverage stuff. So let's, or it means applying software or it, like th there's so many different ways that that can actually be yeah. utilized. So I'm interested to actually talk to you about virtual assistants for a moment because it seems like you're pretty passionate about this. And I've, I guess ever since I read the four hour work week back in, you know, what was it like 2013 that I'm sure it was big before that, and I was kind of late uh, late on the boat on that one. No, I feel like early 2010s is really like when it had it, its its big come up. Yeah, and so I immediately went to Brickwork India, which is the firm that Tim Ferriss talks about in the book. And yeah. I hired some guy, and the price had already gotten up because people had read the book, so I think I paid like 13 bucks an hour for a guy in India, which was not like the, you know, $3.50 an hour I was expecting. But, you know, I'm like, you know, whatever. I, yeah. I, was, I was an intern at the time. <laughs> At, uh, at a company called Deep Local here in Pittsburgh that you probably know about that yep. does advertising. And um, I hired an assistant with my own money that I was making in my internship. And I, I just burned through assistants like for the next maybe like three or I've, I've had 14 of them at oh, this point wow. in my life. Yeah. And I, I finally stopped because I felt like I was getting to be a little bit less self reliant than I wanted to be. And then also somebody stole like six grand on one of my credit cards. Um, and so between those two things, I was like, eh, maybe I should just do my own calendar for a little bit, you know, and, and kind of build up self-reliance. But, you know, I appreciate the lessons I've learned and the management skills I've built. And I feel like it could work just maybe with a little bit of tweaking. I guess what's your journey been like with that? And Yeah. So last year we hired someone in operations at Piper who's fully remote based yeah. in the Philippines. Nice. She's fantastic. Awesome. Highly effective and has been able to run through all the tasks that I can't get to. Because like the, the, the brutal truth of agencies is that it's all man hours against problems. It's the whole nature of the sure. business, right? And so it helps to have less expensive hours that you can deploy, but it also just helps to have more hours because there's always more problems. There's always more priorities. I agree. And if you have the ability to step up a bit and just look more on the business instead of working in the business, which is just like the most, you know, common trope when it comes to like business advice generally but it yep. really does make the difference and i can remember two years ago being like i'm just in it like i i don't even know how to get out of it i don't even know what that would entail yeah but it's the first step towards moving closer to your zone of genius a thing that only you can do that you're once again compounding those skills at a greater um, rate than other people and it's been fantastic have we had to fire people absolutely yeah. yeah like that's building teams maybe not yeah a couple, i mean maybe, that's obviously true of any hiring yeah. problem but i don't know maybe it's because i was well I, it doesn't sound like it's the fact that i was looking at lower cost labor markets because that didn't you're doing that too and you're you're being successful with it so yeah i'm a big believer that talent is much more evenly distributed across geographies than opportunity and yeah. so like there's people of whatever your IQ threshold, I, and I, you know, like the origins of IQ is for job hiring, right? So I, know I did that's, not know that. That that's makes a, sense. That's like a political like thing that gets people going. But like, that's literally the origins of the test was yep. to help companies assess the talent that was coming in and whether or not they were capable of, you know, contributing to the firm. How productive is someone going to be basically? Right. Their, their ability to problem guess. solve, their ability yeah. to comprehend the tasks, so on and so forth. And, you know, they, you can get these IQ uh, tests administered and you look at it, it's like, okay, if that person was the same IQ in a different geography. Well, I agree with you on this. Yeah. So I think it's probably, like you said, in pretty even distribution. I mean, there's cultural differences. Yeah. But I don't know that they're that broad or insurmountable. I mean, the Philippines, as you mentioned, I think is seems to be pretty culturally similar to the U.S. I mean, I've worked with Filipino companies Yeah. That, on both sides of the table, like client and, you know, provider. And, I mean, I don't know. I I think it's a cool culture, very similar to, to America. Yeah. yeah. And all my history, like like prior to Piper, is team sports, team environments. So I probably have a slight advantage, or not slight advantage, a slight strength in the realm of just training people, judging people, coaching people. I have a ton of patience for it. Like relative yep. to other people, like, oh, I have to like do one-on-ones with my team. Like I love doing one-on-ones with yeah, my team. I love extroverted. talking with everyone since, yeah, exactly. I'm extroverted. And uh, further, you know, it's a very kind of piecemeal thing where it's like, I'm not handing, you know, the, the uh, and I don't mean this disparagingly, like I'm not handing the corporate card day one. It's, hey, can you like perform in this, you know, sandbox? Let's expand the sandbox, expand the sandbox. And eventually, you know, 
people people earn trust and i, I i'm also like a believer I, it's the stephen covey book i'm blanking on the it's, it's not seven habits i think it's literally called the speed of trust which is just like you default to trust and you get burned sometimes but yeah. then that default but it's also like what's your appetite for getting burned because sometimes i found that at least with some of the fast-paced engineering projects that um, the firm I work for, SKA, engages in. I mean, it's important to, um, you have to have trust you're not going to get anything accomplished, put it that right. way. And so, with I found that like a really good mechanism for kind of, I guess, a trust hack, if you will, is you know direct referrals. Like I've oh, been for burned sure. by very few people that have been directly referred. Yep. Um, and so that's... That's a great way to just kind of, you know, maybe move a little faster and be able to hand someone a corporate card, you know, on like month one as opposed to a hundred percent and, and, and or whatever. And this is like, you know, I have a, a previous life being more interested in finance. And, you know, the thing that they always have to say from a compliance standpoint is, you know, past performance isn't an indication of future results because they're like, they'll show you this graph like, look, our investment always went up. And then like, you should get it now, even though it's been going up. And oh, it's and about to so go it's down. like uh, technical analysis versus like looking at fundamentals or like way more basic than that okay. yes like way more way more like look at chart go up give me your money so i can invest it for you and collect my fee is really like all there is going on there I and just, yeah, and from a compliance standpoint they have to say past performance isn't a indicator of future results but the truth is screw the market all they're doing is showing you past performance in that pitch exactly okay, yeah. screw the financial industry on multiple levels for now and just stick with people past performance is the number one indicator of future results. Oh, for sure it is. Yeah. And so, like, that's the other thing is, like, can you do the work to get the references if you don't have that referral intro? Can you actually dig into what those past experiences were? Because the other thing is, like... So what's your vetting process for, like, an offshore contract you've never worked with in that way? Uh, two steps of interviews, referral test, background check, um, and then a kind of test period up front to see if they can actually deliver and handle the load. Do you give assignments that... Like, how do you determine your test assignments? Because obviously there's a balance there between usefulness and risk. Right, so yeah. it, it, it's mostly gonna be about communication. And it's like, like, did input one, input two, and input three all get considered to deliver the output? Relatively like simple rudimentary stuff, but yeah. that is like a, a, you know, a pass, not pass filter. And then there's also people like not willing to do it, not worth yeah. my time. It's like also a really powerful indicator of whether- Yeah, that's an engaged. easy one, right? I mean. I think uh, my my dad's a, a surgeon and he had a medical office in the 90s and my mom ran HR for him. And this is kind of a pretty brutal test that they would do, but they would schedule interviews at like 6 a.m. And if the person didn't show up, it was a really easy way to disqualify them. Yeah. And I say it's brutal, but I've started doing stuff like that now. And, and you know, like there was a guy that I was talking to who was trying to sell me um, some kind of subcontracted service. I think it was like, software engineering and, and you probably get hit by these firms all the time i mean they just cast a really wide net and there's tons of them and, and that's a great example of an industry where you know it's cannibalizing itself because there's so much competition in it uh, yeah. i don't know if that's if i worded that right but you know what i mean oh and i so, mean that, that that's a quintessential example of people can do that working from anywhere yep. and so how do you differentiate and, particularly me who's not technical like you would have a much more like difficult filter to pass on something like that but if like it's the tennessee based team versus the croatian based team yeah. versus the croatian team versus the taiwanese team yeah i i really don't know how i would judge the difference i mean some of it comes down to communications and just time zone logistics but and then like the ability to compete i guess if you're doing government contracts you have to have a u.s based team and then right for me, somewhat of an obstacle to international business, unfortunately, is just the enforceability of like NDAs and certain legal documents. So it's much more difficult to enforce those yeah. internationally. But I mean, there are brilliant people everywhere. Like I, I love, you know, working with like immigrants in particular, I don't have to get too political, but like, I mean, the fact that somebody cared enough to come here, you know, and yeah. it is, you know, probably like, you know, just working their ass off to, to make it work. I mean, I, I feel like it sorts for like a better work ethic, smarter type of person, typically. A hundred percent. And and what I find is most people that have any sort of remaining touch with their family history have an appreciation for the immigrant work ethic because yeah. my parents 
uh, what you know, we can trace back. You know, my mom grew up on Polish Hill here in Pittsburgh. Nice. What do you think that the story of that place was? It's a bunch of Polish immigrants <laughs> that landed there. You know, come together to try to make it. Uh, you know, I could go on and on and on. But like, yeah. it, if you if you were at all in touch with your own family history as an American, most likely there's an immigrant story. Oh, in there for somewhere. sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know if you know the T station downtown, uh, the one that's like triangular, the building, the Wood Street Galleries. I am aware of the building, but I'm not super familiar with that it. That used to be my great grandfather's fur coat shop when he came here as a, he was a fur coat merchant in Latvia and moved here. Or, yeah. And that's start, badass. Started that. Yeah. <laughs> so. I love it. Like, yeah, th- those roots, and it's like when you think about how tough anyone that had to do that is now in the past in the future like i would rather have more of those people on my side it's already like taken into like a weird political place but like yeah. on our team you know flying yeah. our colors you for know, sure pushing our direction but i mean there's administrative hurdles is the, is the real you know the bear of the situation right yeah. like i mean you've got to sponsor somebody's visa and now you're in for 10 grand and a hell of a lot of paperwork and yeah i mean it's it's not always easy to, you know, to hire the best folks for the job, unfortunately. And that, that kind of, I don't know, not to be idealistic, but it, you know, it kind of hurts me a little bit inside. <laughs> totally. It's and and it, it, it could be field. better. There's, there, there yeah. is undoubtedly better. And uh, I know I annoy some friends, but as a, yeah. as a kind of baseline optimist, I think we're going to get there. It, it's yeah. definitely not going to be linear. We're definitely not going to get there without, <laughs> you know, bumps and bruises and all sorts of stuff. But yeah. I think we'll get there. Yeah, that's awesome. So I guess, how did you go down the road of founding a uh, company like Piper Creative? Like, what, what did that look like for you? How did you decide to leave finance and go into that? And I guess, what was your journey there? Anyone that's left finance will be, tell you, it, to, wanting to leave was not a hard decision. <laughs> Thinking um, of Dick Zhang in particular, if you know. Yeah, um, so exactly. So, so uh, my story was, I wanted to start uh, a podcast because I was just addicted to the learning experience of like walking all these places. And I know this is so obvious to people now, but like walking places in like 2013 and like learning more in my walk to class than in the class itself. Yeah. And uh, also inspired by the four hour work week, my uh, then girlfriend, now wife at the time, uh, we moved to uh, Asia. We spent uh, half a year traveling around Asia, just Where'd you go? basically a backpack. Uh, Thailand, Vietnam, Jealous. Taiwan, uh, Singapore, a couple other places. That's that awesome. Escaping my living brain. my dream. Yeah. <laughs> um, and on the walk back from a grocery store in Chiang Mai, Thailand, and it wasn't particularly profound, but struck me like a bolt of lightning. That and this just to give you a, t- a time context here. Yeah. This is like twenty. 20- 16-ish, maybe it was tw- early 2017, and this was like in the midst of Gary Vaynerchuk's meteoric rise. I fall in the camp of thinking that Gary Vee is in many ways an innovator, uh, a really impressive entrepreneur, and a heck of a marketer. I know that people don't like him. I I've think heard that name. I don't really know who he is. <laughs> a lot of entrepreneurs, particularly like the yeah. marketer types and the like, very online types, yeah. are checkmark cosign him and then alex hormozzi is kind of the heir to the like entrepreneur of digital business online business online media that like calls it straight isn't you know hoodwinking his audience and selling them bs i mean that's Um, important i think in any sales and there's a lot of there's a lot of charlatans a lot of gurus out there that i do not cosign and maybe you know give me a little more cognac and i'll I'll start (laughs) listing that one for you um happy to share the cognac (laughs) but uh the um during that point in time i'm coming back from the grocery store in chiang mai thailand with our you know our groceries for the next couple days or whatever and it hits me like a bolt of lightning because i'm watching him produce these vlogs from inside his marketing agency vayner media that's probably at like two three four hundred people and i'm like there are going to be a lot of companies that want to produce videos like this Uh, and won't know how to do it that's interesting and it was the first time in my life that any sort of like business trend thing I could I, I could feel with pretty much certainty that I was early to a realization. Didn't know how to execute on it. Didn't know how to tur- you know profit from that. But I was like, other people are gonna figure this out later because I can just tell from the other people I like interface with that yeah. they haven't dialed this in yet. 
And sure enough, over the next like three years, you saw people start following themselves, like having a videographer follow them around and launch YouTube videos and podcasts uh, galore and all this other stuff. Uh, And basically, when I got back from Asia, I pitched my uh, now business partner, Hannah, on a very simple concept. I said, we are going to vlog for other companies and we are going to help them vlog themselves. And the idea, she immediately got it, which is why she's a great business partner, because we have that kind of uh, alignment there and what we spent the last five years doing was making loads of mistakes without question but starting to discover for ourselves from first principles what the recipes are for video marketing for b2b businesses i'll be the first to admit you want the like really cool direct to consumer like you know, Casper match, like any direct consumer brand you can think of. Yeah. That's not my bag. That's not my strength. That's not where I'm going to deliver outsized results. But in the world of B2B, where you're once again selling on the basis of like, don't get me fired, make me feel safe, convey your competence, assure me that this gets done on time with minimal hassle, yada, yada, yada. I know how to package those types of service providers in a video cocoon. That's cool. And so that's what we've spent the last five years kind of piecing apart. And now we're stepping into, number one, the confidence of like saying that, right? Because we were started like, we'll make a video for you. We'll do whatever, you know, whatever you need. Yeah, we did that too at the very beginning, right? We'll do anything. We'll make your website. Like, screw it. (laughs) But now it's, we know who we help. We know how we help them. And when it's time to help them, it's a playbook and not, a whiteboard session from like square one. Yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. What do you think of the Boston Dynamics videos? Uh, just to, because I, when you're talking about, I guess, B2B versus B2C marketing, that came to mind as like a weird counter example. Yeah. So, well, I don't think it's a counter example at all. Interesting. I, I think okay. that it's a perfect example of them just flexing. And I, I know that we were talking before the, uh, uh, recording started about like 48 laws of power yep. but like one of the rules is like you need to show people how strong you are so that they don't <laughs> hurt you and they don't like mess with you and they are flexing what they're capable of and and that gives you positioning in the marketplace that other people don't have yeah. i know that for you know the normies like me that don't really appreciate all of the technical complexity that goes into what they're accomplishing it's scary as hell and feels like the beginning of a dystopian you yeah. know, movie in some ways but alternatively, it's a lot of math, like in difficult math at that, the kind of math I don't know how to do as a robotics engineer, admittedly, which which tells me something and, kind of, yeah. you know, secondhand. But if, if that's what it shows you, then it tells me that they're setting a recruiting bar that's really high. I hear similar things. And yeah. once again, I don't know the actual technical specifications, but the people that work at OpenAI right now yeah. and are developing chat GBT, you know, when they're when they're demoing their stuff and they're not using video necessarily, but when they're demoing that stuff, yeah, it's apparent to the people that know how technically difficult it is what they're accomplishing. Yeah. And for a certain type of person in every domain, the A players want to be around other A players. They yeah. want to feed off of that energy and grow and build and challenge themselves and push themselves to a limit. And they're making it clear that that's what's happening there. Yeah, for sure. But I don't know if I, I would say that they're they're better than me across the board. Like I think there's things that you know, I don't know, I would do differently, right? But again, the math that it takes to keep a robot balanced and coordinated in that way is just something I chose not to specialize in. Yeah. Because it wasn't what made me excited. <laughs> so. Sure, but that like that's also the truth of B2B marketing. B2B yeah. marketing is sell the sellable yeah. and sell the niche, yeah. right? If I said I do video for anyone, anytime, anywhere, it's like, yeah. okay, that I don't, that doesn't make me feel special. But if I yeah. say that this is exactly how you take your robotics business from A to Z or from zero to one with video strategies that help you sell and help you onboard new employees and clients more effectively, that feels like it's something perfectly built for you. And so, yes, they could they could have, you know, more of like the experts probably talking and like, damn, these guys are smart. And like I want to yeah. be around them and learn from them and what have you. Yeah. But I would argue that that's kind of implicit because if you can appreciate the technical complexity of what they're accomplishing, yeah, I guess ChatGPT is a good example as well, where it's you know, it's very impressive to like I'm a relative layperson when it comes to like AI, right? Like that's not my specialty area. Yeah, 
but it's the first AI thing I've really been impressed with that I've been able to demo, I guess, where a lot of it has come off as like snake oil or yeah. people putting AI into their investor pitch because investors love AI or like, yeah. you know, it's not really doing AI. It's rules based. It's heuristic. But people say it's AI because that's what sells, you know. Buzzwords are buzzwords. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, but I, I, I think that they're they're kind of in a different category because they're so unambiguously differentiated from like the other robotics teams that yeah. are out there. But that is still like the argument that if you are that good, you need to flex it a little bit. Like you need to make that legible to the outside world. Yeah. At least the Any people... schmuck can get their mind around like this is game changing technology. Right. Just by using it. I mean, they've made it. I guess for Boston Dynamics, you know, they can't really have a public demo of Atlas because it's like, I don't know if it's still a million dollar robot, but it was a few years ago. Um, but they can show a video of Atlas, you know, like jumping off, you know, tables and doing parkour and all that stuff. Uh, with ChatGPT, because it's all software, they can have a public demo, which is what they've done. Yeah. And Dolly, you know, like any any person can sign on and make an account and like i mean i've done it and it's kind of a fun trick at parties now to bust that out for yeah people i haven't seen it yet that's i mean that's what i did over the holidays nice. i showed like my dad and he was like this is crazy because he's just not in that world at all yeah yeah same i showed my aunt and she's like i don't like this i showed her dolly <laughs> and she she makes art and she's like ah this is gonna ruin art <laughs> so... yeah i i don't have predictions there hopefully hopefully yeah. not too much i don't think it will i mean it's just different right like maybe i don't know maybe it'll It'll probably knock out like some entry level graphics design jobs that, you know, currently exist and yeah. you know, are, are diminishing. I mean but then I guess the, the more optimistic way to look at it is I mean, it's just another way to leverage more out of the limited hours you have in the day if you off load a lot of that to AI you know, the, in some way. There's an economic development guy that I read and, and some of his stuff is over my head, but his name's Eli Dorado and he'll talk about how the effective productivity of the average American worker hasn't actually increased that much despite the digital revolution, which is like very counterintuitive because you're like, we have all these softwares at our so disposal. So you're spending all your time on like snake on your phone? Or like, I, he doesn't have a good explanation of it. But he's candy like, Crush, is, just is sucking a, up all your time. TikTok getting three probably, hours a day. Probably. Cannibalizing what could be productive time. But it's it's a really, and, and, and part of that's like, remains inspiring because like, oh, People haven't gotten that much more productive, but now I have all these tools. If I can focus and if I can really set a definite you can purpose, you yourself if you've got the work ethic. It, yeah. It's there to be had, um, but it is. It's also like this larger, interesting question about like if you're trying to lead a team or an organization, can you empower them with all these tools and 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 have them not think of it? Oh, this thing's about to take my job, and yeah. have it be more this collaborative tool, just as we've used collaborative you know tools from time immemorial. Yeah. to get that greater productivity and that greater outcome. Small and mighty teams. That's interesting. It sounds like, hmm, because that, I mean, that's obviously a question I face as a roboticist all the time is, are these robots going to take our jobs? You know, I mean, that's, yeah. every roboticist gets asked that, you know, and, and every, not every, a few robotics organizations spend a lot of money and resources trying to combat that head on and be like, obviously robots aren't a threat to human jobs. And then well, it's kind of BS, but like they could be, it depends what jobs and you know, like how people adopt the technology. Like, I don't know. I, 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 I've heard both arguments and I'm, it, it's mo mostly like whoever I hear most recently, I'm kind of swayed by because I just yeah. don't have enough domain expertise, but That's you fair. hear a uh, thinker like Jeff Booth, who sold a company that basically was like the Amazon of construction projects. Oh, interesting. Um, and he wrote this book, The Price of Tomorrow, and he's basically like, people can't really, like as, as simple monkeys, we really struggle to appreciate Moore's Law and exponential growth rates. Yeah. But, you know, the... the uh, it's definitely real. It, you know, increasing <laughs> rate of these microchips power and the increasing kind of rate of these different technological innovations it isn't going to be just like linear artificial intelligence growth over the next, you know, 20 years. It's going to have this kind of upward arc that gets relatively intense relatively quickly. And so that's like a very compelling argument. You need to kind of prepare for this world of, in certain ways, abundance. Because if you have abundance of compute and abundance of, you know, free or nearly free 
robotic labor to complete things that should be a very abundant world very productive world yeah. but at the same time it's going to create a lot of chaos and a lot of change and well, I, I think in the near term yes but in the long term no right i mean that's yeah. that's kind of it like you said i mean anytime you fundamentally change the rules you know like people panic because they don't want to lose the status quo totally um and i guess my my point to saying like it depends what jobs is i mean there's jobs that don't need to exist because they're reliant on obsolete you know assumptions about the state of technology i mean like yeah. one example is i was talking to a friend at nasa and um he was telling me that there was this person that was kind of dug into their organization um and they sold a piece of software. I don't remember exactly what it was. It might have been like a database of some kind, I think. And the database was totally obsolete. I think it might have been coded in Fortran, if I'm remembering the story correctly. And it, it just didn't need to exist anymore. And so, you know, my colleague was petitioning to get rid of this person because, you know, they weren't creating value um, with what they were doing. And this person, you know, had allies and they were dug in and they obviously wanted to continue to have a job. And so, you know, it became somewhat of a back and forth. And, um, you know, I'm not saying you should heartlessly, fi you know, heartlessly fire people for no reason. But, you know, it's interesting because, you know, when you're running a business, you also have to consider, you know, like, why are we spending this money? And, you know, is this something that's actually getting the business you know, a return on its investment. And if the answer is no, then I don't think you should go right to taking away someone's job, but I do think you should consider, like, is there something more productive we can have this person doing? Or if there is there a way, you know, that we can, you know, maybe, you know, leverage our resources more intelligently. And in this case of the story, they ended up, you know, they didn't fire the person, um, but they did give them, you know, a newer piece of software to administrate, you know, which I think was a good solution. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes a ton of sense. And I think that the core of what your friend did was tell the truth and tell an uncomfortable truth. And one of the values that we have in our, our company is true kindness, not nice. There's a sign going on. It actually ticks me off. I see this sign in like co-working spaces. Where it's like uh, work hard and be nice to people. I don't buy that. It's not about niceness. It's about kindness, which is often involving a heart uh, involves delivering a hard truth to a loved one in a loving way, in an empathetic way. Yeah. So it, we can make progress. And to me, the the whole thing about like, I bring up the, you know, remote work is gonna do to white collar, what globalization did to blue collar, yeah. is because if you're not aware of that, if you're if that's not on your radar, then that's when it feels like a, a bat hitting in the middle of the night that you weren't prepared for. Yeah. But if you can see the train coming from all the way down the track, you all, everyone has the potential and the intelligence and the capability to get off the, you know, the rails and go a different direction. And so like, that's, that's basically the idea there is like, I'm seeing it, I'm experiencing it similar to being a little bit early to video. I feel like I'm a little bit early to this compared to most people. And I just want people to be aware of it. If you're aware of it and then you decide, eh, I'm not going to do anything about it, turn my brain off, <laughs> then I can't do anything for you. Right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But for the folks that probably listen to a, a show like this, who are thoughtful, who are not, you know, they're not spending their time just, you know, zone in turn your your brain off but like actually trying to expand their mind this is the type of thing that should enter the calculus of all the decisions that they're making and probably help them uh, accomplish a little bit more and have a little bit more financial security yeah that makes a lot of sense so i guess as as a white collar individual in a first world country what can i be doing to to get ahead of the curve and improve my position it, it just comes back to leverage so there's yeah. a uh, a guy by the name of eric jorgensen who wrote the almanac of naval ravikant and he's currently writing the almanac of balaji srinivasan two of the top thinkers of silicon valley and he has a course all about leverage it's just how can you apply leverage to your personal life and thinking in those terms in an exponential world also has the ability to catapult you to crazy high special places yeah but simultaneously it's thinking in those terms that makes you think more like a business owner, more like an entrepreneur, that makes you really hone in on the zone of genius, the things that insulate you from, you know, hey, we're gonna, we're seeing it with layoffs right now in tech, right? We're gonna lay off all these people and partially they weren't even really working at all, right? But I'm, I'm sure that Google, when they axed whatever 18,000 people, 
didn't ax their like absolute creme de la creme engineers, right? Yeah. Those people were completely secure. They saw like the subject in the email that said layoffs happen today, and they didn't think must be me. Well, that's not entirely true. So I, I I'm not in those bureaucracies, so I, I I I'm speculating there. I say this because I have friends at all these companies, and so I um I have a friend um at Meta when they did their layoffs who was fucking terrified. <laughs> And this isn't a dumb person. Right? Yeah. I have a friend at Google when they did all their layoffs who was fucking terrified. Also not a dumb person. Neither one got laid off, by the way. Yeah. But, um, you know, I I will check in with my, my buddies at those places just to kind of get the temperature and see how it's going. And, you know, I, I'm being anecdotal. I have more than one friend at both of those organizations. It could be anybody. But, sure. you know, I'm just saying it like... And that's the nature of being in those organizations, just like from a job security standpoint, you're, you're aware of there's, there's a, a bureaucracy that well transcends the experience that you're having yeah. in that world. Well, I think if fear is in the water too, I mean, you know, like it's, it's a little bit contagious. Of, of course, fear is yeah. in the water. And then also just, you know, the, there's a degree to which that's just the human experience, right? We're still going to tap into insecurity. Like I'm yeah. sounding very confident right now on the podcast. Of course, I have moments of insecurity when all the time, <laughs> you know, the client churns and the you know the person that I hired doesn't work out the way I expected him to. Like, every in all no the way work shape, falls onto your shoulders. Exactly, all at once. Not infallible in any way, shape, or form. But the hope, and you know, I try to breathe when I see that into other people. I try to breathe that confidence into them of like, you're pretty darn talented, even if they make the really stupid error of letting you go. You're gonna land on your feet because of all the hard work that you do because of your diligence, because of your, you know, kind of perseverance. I don't say that to the people that I don't believe that to, yeah. but I try to surround myself with those type of characters. And I'm yeah. sure that you're the same way. Sure. And I'm sure that like when they were feeling that anxiety, like, dude, you're gonna be fine. Like you're one of the smartest people I know. Like I'm I'm, yeah. I'm gonna get you in a great place. Yeah. I, I you know, I would I would back well, you. Well I, I have a friend who recently was laid off, um, and I happen to think that they're in the upper echelons of the company they were laid off from and it was probably you know an erroneous decision on the part of the person who laid them off or made that firing decision and so you know i'm currently in the process of helping them find a new job and i've been introducing them to yeah. directors vps and executives at different companies around town that i think they'd be a good fit for and my default optimism says man that's really good for the startup ecosystem because it's always like the big bloated large companies that have to do all these layoffs or the ones that were just terribly mismanaged and didn't know how to handle cash but for all the folks that were like just trying to build a little momentum and just didn't have the budget because you know google came in up here and they just came in somewhere much more moderate not even like low they're like okay now we can actually get access to this type of talent that's otherwise been kind of hoovered up by these few companies yeah for sure well, that's definitely true. I mean, and I've seen that as well with not even just startups. I would say like just large old school companies that don't want to pay, you know, more than 70% of market for people. I mean, they can't compete with like a Tesla or a Google that's willing to pay you know, right. 200% of market yep. for, for a person, you know, which of course raises market, you know, and so it's, it's an interesting thing to, to witness. Yeah. But I, I, I'm, I'm fundamentally optimistic for anyone that is cognizant of yeah. those factors and 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 you know there's mindset work that's in there too and that can sound woo woo and hokey in certain ways but i'm i'm a believer in it uh, can you elaborate on that like what that actually means yeah so you know books like how to win friends and influence people sure. think and grow rich like there is a degree to which it's kind of hand wavy woo woo like you, you, you're gonna know that how to win friends and influence people is woo woo i mean there, there is a degree to which it's it's kind of positioned that way or understood yeah. that way. Or actually, more importantly, I don't think it's the books themselves. I think it's the way people read a book and then it, put it into practice, which is you know maybe, their interpretation. Maybe like the uh, what is it, the gift or like the there's so, one that comes off really woo woo to me. So the gift yeah. is a is a derivative of yeah. think and grow rich, which is a deriv derivative of the laws of success. Yeah. So it's like once again, first principles. If you can get back to the source material. It probably makes a hell of a lot more sense. Solid stuff. But yeah. then, you know, people do their interpretations. And, Bastard does. Exactly. Yeah. And so from that standpoint, 
uh, a, a lot of the work that I did last year was born from the laws of the success. law of attraction or whatever they <laughs> exactly they it, that literally it's all yeah. the same constellation of thought. Well, I don't know that that's wrong psychologically. Like I, I think I, I concur with that hypothesis in, in some ways, and that you know people are drawn to success, and if you believe that you can accomplish something, then you have more confidence that you're going to exert when you're trying to achieve it. Where if you don't, I mean, you're probably not going to put a whole lot of effort in that direction. I mean, there's there's Precisely. real logical, psychological reasons for it. But then I feel like where people turn it into magic is where then, like, they like call it like a law. It's like, that, well, that's kind of fallacious, I think, you know? And, yeah, I, I totally agree. It's not that being optimistic or being positive guarantees success. It's that failing to be prohibits you from getting there. Yeah, for sure. But... I mean, to, to go to stoicism, I guess, like, I think that optimism and positivity are important, but I think they should be coupled to reality. Like, there's... Undoubtedly. I, I, I guess I, I am often the cynic in the room, because <laughs> I'm an engineer, but I, I also, you know, I there's plenty of times when I've been given a task where I didn't think that it was going to be... I didn't, well, I shouldn't say I didn't think it was going to be achievable. I should say I didn't know how we were going to achieve it when it was assigned. Yeah. And that's always kind of a great feeling when, and that's confidence boosting when you're able to surmount like what seems like an impossible challenge. And that's addictive, right? I mean, that's like very reinforcing. And I'm sure you felt this way too in your, yeah. your business with some of the things you've done. And, and that's why, you know, the experience and the confidence compounds and, and you're able to get different deals. But I think that, um, you know, coming back to that principle of how do you prepare your mind to reach a certain point I do believe that success leaves clues I think that it's a very cynical kind of jaded take to just chalk everything up to survivorship bias because I've, I've, I've what's had, a survivorship bias? survivorship bias is like the person on stage that says I never gave up so you should never give up and it's like okay that's wildly reductive like people people will basically throw us on it specifically that framing and be like that doesn't make any sense whatsoever I think I like Joel Olstein here I don't know if that's yeah I I honestly don't consume much of anything that he says so I could not call I've Joel just Olstein. seen a couple of clips and I'm like this person is a predator you know? and, 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 and yeah and there is yeah. a there is a whole contingent of those characters online yeah. as I said before who it's like don't they, sue me Joel they, <laughs> they kind of you know they say the words they paint with the brush and people you know get excited there but at the same time it's like if I could crack open, you know, three s skulls and metaphorically understand how they work to use it to my advantage, yeah. I would want to crack open the skulls of the most successful marketing agency builders, company builders in history to yeah. understand that. Luckily, we don't have to actually crack open skulls. We can read biographies. Yes, we can consume, <laughs> you know, who their you, writings. Who do you identify as those people, I guess? Um, so I, I mentioned earlier Alex Hormozzi. Alex Hormozzi is an absolute tour de force in business strategy. And he is just at like the beginning of that exponential curve of people who are trying to build businesses respecting his opinion a great deal. He yeah. uh, was worth about 100 million by the age of like 31. And he will be a billionaire before he's like 35, 36. Wow. Um, a just stone cold operator across every facet of business building and a fantastic communicator of the models and frameworks that he used. Because if you think about it, to scale to that size, he had to train all of his people on those models and frameworks of sales, yeah. of prospecting, of implementation. Easier said than done. Them. I mean, that means you really have to understand it yourself. Deeply, yeah. deeply, deeply. So he's someone of the kind of present that I really study and, and try to incorporate a lot of his stuff into. And then there's a fantastic podcast, as fellow podcast lovers, yeah. um, called Founders. Oh, cool. Which is a weekly show uh, where the host reads a biography and then basically just gives you like the distilled, it's kind of spark notey, but like still yeah. an hour or two hours of like his well, thoughts cool. on everything that he consumed. And he has all this context. And then because he's read so much, he can do the like interconnection points between like, hey, this thing that Henry Ford did is actually a lot like uh, what Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart, did. Yeah. And it's like, oh, this guy, like, Estee Lauder is actually a lot like, so, and like, could make all these connections. 
and it just helps you see the commonalities of success really does leave clues it's like oh all four of them did this exact same behavior yeah i should probably incorporate that saul price who created uh the store that was the predecessor to costco costco influenced sam walton's creation of sam's club yeah. and jeff bezos's creation of amazon prime That's if all four of those people do the same thing and i'm in retail I need to do that. That's thing. interesting. No it's questions. It's not necessarily asked. a personal habit so much as a business practice, though. That's interesting because when, at first, when you said if all these people are doing this thing, I thought you meant like you know I don't know worshiping the devil, or <laughs> waking up at four a.m. or like yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's, going it's, to church on Sunday, singing you know blues in the shower. I don't know, just like a, a thing. It's never those things, but yeah. what it is for all of them is their ability to go from like ten thousand feet all the way down to the surface at the micro details yeah. with precision. So I try to train that. I need to yeah. think about like, what are we trying to do at a high level strategy level with the business? But I need to get into every number and feel comfortable talking about it, whether it's you know the performance of this specific video on YouTube and what the click-through rate means, or if it's when we put this ad on this platform, what is the ROAS? Like I need to be able to be that low level practitioner and simultaneously like strategically, how are we trying to get B2B company A to point element OP? Okay, so it's a lot more direct and like correlated to business practice it, yes yes That's but there cool. is also the like don't give up and then there's also you know the, the, back to the books like think and grow rich like do you have a definite purpose do you have a mastermind that you're talking to with regularity do you seek expert counsel so i was super hesitant to ever hire coaching oh, interesting or i do all that stuff but i didn't i've never read the book <laughs> right and, and that's because it is these kind of timeless patterns that yeah. have worked for you know, Andrew Carnegie, and we could go on and on through these yeah. different characters. But if you have those different principles and they've worked for all these other people, well, at least try them. Yeah. If you try them and it's still, you know, a complete crapshoot, then okay, like back to the drawing board. But like, I'd rather start with those and implement those and see where I land than, you know, just continue to guesstimate or, or you know, get, it's a, uh, you know. Shoot from the hip. Yeah, shoot from the hip or, or take advice from just any person that's willing to offer it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's interesting. I will say one thing I've kind of started doing maybe in the last like year and a half is trying to go to the gym early or like kind of get some sort of cardio in. Yeah. And I know this is different. This isn't business strategy. This is a personal habit. But I feel like it really does help to, to build discipline and to, to, I mean, that discipline sort of pervades into other areas of work and business, you know? And, yeah. And my dad's my dad's an engineer and uh, he, he has a couple different like uh, mentors that really helped him on, on in his career. And uh, one of them always says, everything matters. Treat every small thing like the big thing. Yeah. And, it's all, and that really is a way of saying it's all connected, That's right? That's interesting. So when you treat your body with greater respect and you set the standard of greater discipline, that is going to translate into other things, unequivocally. Yeah. Yeah. And you, know, you experience that, you see that it's true, and then you stop looking for like, you know, the perfect citation that proves it's just like no i've experienced it i know what, i know what that's like yeah at a certain point you just kind of have to like you know make a decision and get on with your life yeah i've got a relative um who is a very high up executive at, at a big company that you've heard of and um one of the things that they always do which i think is interesting and i'm trying to get better at adopting in my life is just maintaining a really ordered workspace yeah and so, you know, just minimal uh, amount of clutter on any given desk, um, you know, and then, I don't know, I, I think there's something to that. I haven't fully gotten my mind around that yet, but it seems to be like another common, common theme that you see with a lot of people that are, you know, getting to higher echelons and executive leadership. Yeah, the, the most impressive thing to me, the more I study the different, um, you know, people at that higher echelon, is how simple they make things. Like we're just focusing on one thing or I just I just don't do that thing. They prune so much away. Yep. And it's like so easy in the early stages, like I'm just gonna do everything like we said before. But it's kind of like uh, you're gonna, um, it's kind of like entropy, like all these things are starting to like fall apart and like, yeah. you know, uh, assemble to one another when they don't necessarily need to be. And they just keep pruning stuff away and keeping it simple and, you know, not yeah. letting the stuff build so, up. Like, I'm not on Facebook. That's one thing I was like, this is costing me you know, yeah. an hour a day of my valuable time. And yeah. it's giving me emotional distress and I, I really don't like doing this. And so like when I cut that out, I mean, just, you know, clarity of mind went up, you know, it was, it was like, uh, would you say you have a definite purpose? 
I feel like I do, yeah, to make awesome robots and, you know, build things better than anyone else can. <laughs> I dig it. I, I, I think that, you know, for me, our, our current focus is to help 100 clients achieve better video marketing and add at least a million dollars in revenue to their top line. That's awesome. If we do yeah. that, our business is going to be fine, right? Yep. But it's not like, hey, we need annual revenue X or like certain amount of leads Y. Everything else is kind of downstream of that. We have to reach out to those companies if we want to help those 100 companies. Yep. We have to have a process that onboards them correctly to do that. But that's born from the laws of success, which is if I can articulate that, my friend, I, so I recommended the book to the friend and he was like, do you want to join this like new book club that's kind of like about being a dad? And I was like, I'm sorry, this isn't in alignment with the the aim that I have right now. He's like, that was a test. That was, you know, checking you on your, your definite purpose. Jeez. And it was like one of those things like, okay, affirming, like he, he gave me the test. I passed it. That doesn't mean I'm going to, I'm you know, check box. I'm it's just a weird move anything. for like a friend to be like... <laughs> You pass the test. <laughs> yeah, well, it, we have that type of relationship yeah. where we are pushing each other to yeah. be greater. And, and, that's you know, pretty cool, actually. That's another thing. Once again, the yeah. the not the uh, seek expert counsel, but the mastermind, the ability to put your head together with a bunch of other smart people yep. and collaborate towards these different goals. He's in that corner for me, yeah. where he's he knows that I'm holding a certain standard that I don't hold the most people that I come into contact with. Because if you hold some like absurd standard to everyone, that's how you come off like a prick who just like can't yeah. get along with anyone. Yeah. But within a certain circle, we've all checked in, our standards raise a certain level, yeah. then we'll challenge each other more because of that trust, you know, trust allows that to happen. Yep. And, um, you know, so he's, he's in that corner for me of people that are pushing me to be better. I guess that's a good point. Like I have an advisor who will like intentionally try to get me to divulge information that I should not be divulging. Right. And then when I'm like, no, he's like, good. <laughs> like, exactly. But if you did, it's not like he'd go run away to the authorities. He'd yeah. be like, do you realize what you just did? Let me yeah. correct you because this is like the safe sandbox in which to play. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, and, and I mean, I guess you're right. It is important to be able to, to have that level of honesty and like you said, just, you know, mutual improvement with certain colleagues and otherwise you never get better. Yeah. And, and it's crazy. Like once you start, so, so I only started here in the last like half year or so of like paying more for coaching than I ever have in the past. And then you, like I'm, I'm studying different people now and they're like their bar for what a one day mastermind, like they'll pay like tens of thousands of dollars for to just get access to that room for a day and a half. Oh, interesting. And it's like, oh man, that moves my goalposts. But back to Hormozy, who I articulated before, his whole framework is, you know, everyone wants to work their job, invest into the S and uh, the S and P. It's like, okay, I'm taking a little bit, I'm putting the S and P, and that's like my whole strategy. He's like, put it in the S and me, put it, invest it into your ability to have that differentiated it's skill set. Pretty cute. Ha it, it, he, I mean, he's good with those like models yeah. and and little. I, I, uh, I'm thinking of the Elements of Eloquence, uh, which is kind of a fun book where it's like that doesn't make any sense but because it rhymes it works exactly and and, and it <laughs> what does speaks. the S stand for nothing <laughs> <laughs> exactly but you think about it's like okay if I'm consistently compounding my inputs and their quality and, and the frequency with which that's coming in that's the only reason that I'm gonna have a staying power. You know, like Piper's gonna be five years old next year. That will nice. make us a statistical anomaly in the world of small business. SKA just turned seven. Let's go. <laughs> and so we're both statistical anomalies. Yep. And you know, this isn't like the back padding session, but the framework of whether it's us or past <laughs> guests like Ergen, uh, Jorgen Pedersen, like to just stick through it, just, just forget everything else, just to have the discipline and the perseverance to stick through it automatically makes you differentiated and you have a ton of hard-earned lessons that if you could go back and tell first year uh spencer of like you know having his own business would have been on a completely different different well trajectory. i'm sure i would have not listened to myself anyway i mean i had plenty of advisors try to but then different advisors contradict each other i'm sure you've experienced this too and yep. like i mean nobody's 100 percent infallible and, and knows all the time and sometimes Certainly. you have to learn lessons through failure but I like to think it, I would trust myself more than just yeah, probably. Else. I mean, that's like like a gold standard. It's you, so the trust is in theory at one. But yeah, I don't know. Like, I feel like there'd still be like this idea of like, ah, fuck you, future you. You don't know anything. Yeah, future me. You don't know anything. Exactly. It'd be it'd be good. Uh, good soap opera at the very least. Yeah. 
<laughs> for sure. What um, what would you tell yourself if you could actually be in that scenario? Definite purpose and focus. It's the number one thing. Because I, I like I come into enough contact with enough people that are smart, that are hardworking, that are capable, and like now I see the differentiator. I've I have one friend in particular got an agency agency it's a solo operation right now all the talent in the world unfocused like it's it's i can barely art i can barely put all the things he's doing in a box and if it was just applied against one single aim unequivocally he would reach a different place and like it's i'm bringing it up right now because it's like it's kind of gnawing at me and i want to check in with him and be that person that raises the standard that says dude this is what you need to do right now and i've kind of said it once before but like he, it didn't land. I need to dial it up a bit as that responsibility as a friend. And, you know, I desperately needed that at the beginning of what we're doing. There's a ton of other things that I completely fucked up. Like, uh, you know, you shouldn't have the entirety of your invoices be paid after the job's complete. Like, have them pay at least some of it up front. That would have been just like 101 stuff that I wish. Oh, I interesting. yeah, for sure. I completely agree. Um, but that's like, I think that's just like a standard lesson that every service provider has to learn. Uh, yeah, well, that first started. invoice is kind of a, it's almost like a barometer for, you know, timeliness of payment. Like, yeah. You know, and I mean, if somebody's like, I don't know, I, I, I'm thinking of like clients we've onboarded where, you know, it took them, like, they were, like, double payment terms on, like, a $200 invoice. And you're like, God, how much is the, you know, yeah. the big one going to take to get to us, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah, 100%. Uh, so definitely would have learned that. But the, but the focus is, um, it's it's just an unfair advantage because it, it's it's so clarifying because it allows you to say no. That when, when you're starting anything, it's so hard to say no because yeah. it's, like, all these opportunities. Yes, 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 and yes, and yes, and. And build a portfolio. And it build a portfolio, but like, I don't even know who my like target market is. Like I, I just, there's just so much insecurity and anxiety and, and being unsure of what the next step is. And if you have potential, if you have talent, if you have, you know, a brain between those two ears, then if you can apply that against a very narrow, like now we're getting into the physics that you would know better than me, but like you just apply it against a more right, narrow physics. point, then <laughs> we're going to be able to, you know, Move the world, Archimedes style. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. What about you? What advice to yourself? I mean, I think not taking work on. Well, this is a different one because, or an interesting one, I should say. So, there's definitely jobs I took early on where I sort of lost my shirt, but in some ways, I'm glad I did them because I feel like. I don't know. So one job that that I did early on in SK's existence, where it cost me seven thousand dollars to do this job, mm. right? I, I didn't make a dime. I spent seven grand, and um, I'm like, well, that's way cheaper than what you know I paid to get my master's degree, you know, and I learned a yeah. heck of a lot from it. And so I don't know. Maybe I would do that again. Like maybe that was just like a lesson in the school of hard knocks, and you know, it's it's good that I had that experience. I think that that's the framing usually, right? Because we there's I mean, unless there's some sort of really seismic breakthrough, we're not going to actually get to go back in time and tell yeah. ourselves stuff. But you hope to share it with the next young aspiring builder yeah, so that true. they can stand on our shoulders. Yeah. And it is also helpful. You know, you learn also through teaching. It's You learned it first hard knock style. Yeah. But then when you articulate it again, you're re-solidifying in your brain that yeah. I learned this lesson and, you know, God willing, you're... So, okay, so if in that context, then, maybe a, a way to look at it is um, be willing to say no to work. So. Yeah. And, and, yeah, saying no to anything There's, is once you have that, that clarity of where you're trying to get to. Yeah, and, and it's not always easy to do that. I mean, I guess <laughs> it's going to sound really bad, but stay away from the startup market. It's would be a, a tough another market one. to sell it's, into. It's a very challenging market. I mean... Like in particular, like pre-seed startups are, are very challenging. They're highly demanding. They're often tire kicking and will abuse free services at the onset of a relationship. Yep. Um, well, I don't think this is that controversial. I mean, it's it's common startup practice. Like I, I think this is pretty normal to talk to vendors about you know like the volume of work that you could bring in if this first thing goes well. But yeah. You know, and, and it's not entirely disingenuous, but it's a little bit contrived, I feel like, in some cases. I think, you know, and I, I'm not pointing the finger at any one organization here, um, but 
I think in general, like a lot of the startup wisdom is doesn't really explain why that is as much as maybe they should. So, you know, it's just like just tell them that there will be future work. You know, which if taken at face value is maybe a little bit disingenuous, but if explained from the perspective of you know because you know if you do your job right there will be then i think it comes from a place of more sincerity and it's not like pulling the wool over a vendor's eyes or abusing a relationship yeah so much as it is you know like asking them to believe in you which i think there's nothing wrong with that but i, I think the way that a lot of people perceive it and and unfortunately behave is you know to try to see how much they can get for nothing and it's just not conducive to building trust in business, unfortunately. And what, what I've also experienced, though, is that kind of back to that idea of, like, you have to have the positive thinking to have a chance. Yeah. Like, they're not just fooling you or pulling the wool over your eyes. Yeah. It's that they are also basically having to experience self-delusion to yeah. get through how difficult a situation is that yeah, stands right in sure. front of them. And so they're doing that to recruit anyone to their team. They're doing that to recruit their investors. They're doing that to recruit... Every everyone kind of in their orbit, yeah. and so I, I I completely empathize with that, and that's why we've you know largely not not talking to people who have less than a million in annual revenue, yeah. And it's because you know I, I'm happy to you know give them advice. I'm happy I to do that too. You know, point them in the right direction. I, I try to I try to be kind of generous but bounded with the free consulting with companies like that. So exactly, you know, you want to. You know, it's I think of it more altruistically than from a business development perspective. Like it's, you just want to be nice. Like it's good karma. Yeah. You know, like for instance, like SK doesn't have an internship program at this point because it was costing us too much money to do that and we spent a lot of time, energy and, and dollars, you know, developing people that just went on to do another thing and it just wasn't good at our scale. Yep. And so, you know, at this point, I'm upfront about that with anybody that comes to me asking, you know, if SKA is looking for interns in any field, pretty much. And I'm just like, unfortunately, no, because it was costing our business a lot of money. However, if you want to get coffee, I'm happy to buy you a coffee and I'll answer any questions you want to know in that hour and, you know, give you career advice because, you know, I want to be helpful here. You know? Yeah. And, you know, there will be a time when you do get more experience where I would like to recruit you and, if I leave a good impression, then, you know, we have the door open for that relationship. Exactly. Exactly. And it all compounds and it's all coming back to you in some way that you can't anticipate. But if, you yeah. know, they say a nice thing, oh, you know, Spencer hooked me up and, and you know. Yeah. Well, and well. even with the startup market, I mean, I've gotten some great friends that are now in positions of more power after their startups have failed at bigger companies. Yeah. And, you know, where I've given maybe like 40 free consulting hours early in my career when I had the bandwidth to do that sort of thing. And, you know, some of those people, you know, have gone on to, you know, return the favor, you know, once they've sort of advanced in their careers. And that's, that's been kind of nice. So, absolutely. You know, none of it's hard and fast. I just, I feel like it's maybe it's a level of effort thing where, like, you know, you're just like just bound, you know, your, your amount of time for, yeah. you know, pro bono work. I mean, at least what I experienced the back to the entrepreneurs that I've either interviewed or interacted with that achieved the most success, they all kind of defaulted to that, you know, give first, give without expectation mentality to a point within the realm of like what they were trying to accomplish. Yeah. But tend to be some of the most generous people, you know, uh, Jason Wolf, um, Jorgen Pedersen, amongst many others, yeah. some of the most generous people you come into contact with. And it's because they know it nets out in some way, even if it's not super transactional, linear, like I scratch your back, you scratch mine. There's a general degree to which we're all reciprocal beings that yeah. want to. Well, you want to do good things for the community and the profession and, you know, help people develop professionally. I think that's all important stuff. And yeah, I mean, people have done that for you and I early in our careers and that's Absolutely. helped us get where we are. And, and Alana was one of my like very first interviews and I did not know what I was doing. Put my foot directly in my mouth and she, you know, handled it with grace and, and was still a great interviewee. So it, it well, actually, I don't know that I've had Alana in here yet. I should get her. I've had Afshan and Terry Glick and Mike for Micah. Yep. But not Alana yet. She's good. Yeah. Yeah. What's the goal for the show? What's, what's the next step? Think. Um, for the podcast? I mean, to be honest, it's for me, and this is going to sound bad, and I know this is counter to maybe what I should be doing, but it's kind of a passion project. I mean, I, I really enjoy just having interesting conversations with people that I think are doing interesting 
things in their fields. And I, I like hearing from, you know, some of the smartest people in the world about, you know, what drives them and what makes them tick and, you know, what gets them out of bed in the morning and how they arrive to where they are and where they want to go next and, you know, what they think in terms of, you know, industry trends. And that all keeps me, you know, very mentally stimulated. So for no other thing than to have a guaranteed intellectual conversation every week. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to keep doing it regardless of whether or not people like it. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, and I know that's not like the answer I think you were asking for because, you know, it's not like a KPI or. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah. I, I hope hopefully I haven't completely conveyed yeah. myself as like a cold, hard, like KPI driven yeah. taskmaster. But I, I mean, I think that there's a there's a beauty in that and there's a sustainability to that where if it wasn't a passion project and you were purely doing it for some objective I wouldn't be doing it that's why people burn out like that's why yeah. people wouldn't continue to pursue it so I think that there's a lot there and, and there's probably a lot of other kind of tertiary benefits at, at least at least what I found is there's all these additional relationships points of context ability to just see more of the board to like come yeah. up even just a little bit like oh I get that a little bit better. Not that I'm an expert now because I, you know, spoke to this one roboticist, but like, okay, I can kind of see the machinations. Of well, the rabbit hole always goes deeper, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. What about you? What are, what are your goals for your podcast? Um, so we're actually less for the first time, honestly, in years and years and years, I'm taking a break and not on my weekly publishing schedule because we're trying to publish these video essays on YouTube that we're putting a lot of work into and it's kind of not a, a huge divorce from from my interests or what content i've made in the past uh but it's kind of closer to that founders podcast where it's like let's go deep on a specific you know model of business building or uh tactic or strategy that yep. these you know top line business builders used internalize it for myself teach it for the audience show a different kind of editing pacing that our team's capable of. Yeah. And, you know, that better, once again, aligns with our purpose of like, hey, we could do this for you. And that's really compelling. Yeah. Um, and so that's the big focus right now. It's still the, that makes a lot of sense. the same type of stories, but it's it's giving me a little bit permission, a little bit more permission to be authoritative as opposed to the skill of being the kind of thoughtful interviewer that you have that I've tried to cultivate um, Thanks. And, and continue to just push my communication skills to a higher level. Yeah, for sure. No, that actually, I'll be honest, I quite like consuming content like that because you, you do feel like it's economizing of your time, which yes. this podcast does not. And thank you for listening this far if you have. <laughs> so, yeah. But uh, I don't know. I mean, it depends what you're trying to do, right? If you want to observe like two intelligent people talking about philosophy then this is the podcast for you but if you want a concise summary of a business uh practice probably not right i mean that yeah. takes a lot more deliberation and you know scripting and like you said editing work and i mean it's 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 a different thing entirely yeah and it's an opportunity for growth too it's like we, we've not really cracked that medium yet and so it's the iterative process. We have two in the work right now and, and a couple scripts coming down the pipe. And so it's just going to be a fantastic learning experience. All else fails. And I, I, I don't think they're going to fail, but, um, you know, it, it, it's, I've kind of set myself up for a win-win regardless. Yeah. Have you had people, like, recognize you just in public from your podcast? Yes. Nice. Um, but very – so I'm, I'm, I tend to be a homebody. I'm not, like, going out – uh, with any sort of regularity, yeah. occasionally date nights with the wife. But when her family has come to town, three separate instances, we <laughs> take them out to Pittsburgh. Nice. And that's when I've been recognized. And so <laughs> they think I'm like famous, which I am not in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> Hopefully the self awareness is coming through there. But yeah. they think that like I'm the king of Pittsburgh, yeah. which is like a pretty cool position to have with your extended family. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I've had it happen twice because this is a pretty fledgling podcast. And yeah. one of them was at a trade show, which, I mean, that, that's no surprise. I mean, this is a robotics industry podcast primarily. Or... But that's the power of video marketing, though, is, is precisely that experience that you had at the trade show. I've experienced something similar at the Pittsburgh Technology Council because I've interviewed so many of the different founders yep. that are in the council. And so I go to this event and I feel like I'm in the in crowd. 
Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm getting, you know, tangentially recognized, maybe not even because they saw the show, because it's like, hey, we did a podcast six months ago. And that effect in and of itself is worth yeah. the investment that's been made into it. But there's all sorts of other tertiary benefits. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I mean, it does make you happy when somebody takes the time to, you know, view your content that you've worked hard on and, and you know spent money and tears and yeah you know tried to hit a production schedule to to bring them you know and, and there's a there's a rule of the internet that i learned very early on with content it's called the 99 one rule which is more of like a rule of thumb than like a, a law right yeah so the, um 90 percent of people are never going to comment interact in any way shape or form they're just going to consume and then carry on their merry way nine percent will like pop in every once in a while hey this was good really enjoyed this whatever and then 1% will be like the noisy outliers that like, yeah. hey, I hate this. Hey, I love this. Oh, my God. Maximum enthusiasm. Yeah. And what you have to learn is to, you know, overlook that 1% most of the time. But then also not get freaked out by the 90%. Like there's yeah. people that are just, you know. Well, if you're in it for fame, I think you would, which you're not getting that as a podcaster unless you're like Joe Rogan or Lex right. Friedman. I mean, <laughs> so. it's a rabbit hole that I'm not going to go into, but, yeah. but, but just cog, like cognitively, Sorry, recognize- I didn't mean to- no, no, no. I, I know that we, we went, we had a, a lunch where we went yeah. a little bit deeper on, yeah. uh, uh, respective fandoms or lack of fandoms. Yeah, um, yeah for sure. The <laughs> that conversation, the, um, point though is it's, it's very easy to get, like get disheartened and be like, I'm screaming into the void, what have you. But it's actually really affirming to understand that that's just a general principle of this content. Yeah. And that there's a lot of people that just like, I see you. And, and maybe they don't even say it, but in their mind, like, I see you. And that is something. Yeah, for sure. That's it's a good little ego stroke. Yeah. <laughs> I, w- I was at uh, Industry Public House a little bit ago, and a guy recognized me from the podcast. And it made me look really good because... I was talking to the owner of another contract engineering company that we were thinking of doing business with. And they yeah. was like, oh my God, are you Spencer Krause? I'm like, yeah, make me look good for the in-laws. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, I think that there's like the sitcom yeah. uh, premise of that, of like going to the bar and paying everyone in advance to like act like they're your friend before you get there. It's like, <laughs> it's pretty funny. absolutely like, you know, tilt the, the table in your favor. Yep. And I, I totally didn't do that. I just got lucky that the one time someone recognized me as... Well, most of my going out these days anymore is it's either like I don't know I guess I'll do dating because um, I'm like mostly single, and then the other thing I'll do is just like you know grab cocktails with colleagues like on a pretty regular basis or lunches or yeah and I don't know I, I feel like it as an extrovert right like I mean I I guess I, it's weird to label but like I like being around people so I guess it's probably an accurate label like. It's engaging for me. It's a way for me to have a social life. Um, but then, as you know, a heartless taskmaster, as you put it, you know, it's a way for me to also be garnering business utility from those interactions. And so, yeah. Um, and I, I think that the. I guess dating life is different, but that's sort of like a different thing. Some would, ar- some would argue not, but I, I, I don't know if I necessarily. Want to <laughs> I, I think it has to be. Otherwise, like, that's, I don't want to live in a world where like dating is a business transaction. Yeah, uh, I completely, completely agree with that. And I think that in general, as much as you can, pushing the all relations into that other category, not the heartless taskmaster, but the like, I trust in karma, I'm going to spend time around people I want to spend time around, I'm going to try to have the most engaging, authentic conversations that I possibly yep. can, in whatever format, recorded in a podcast over Szechuan, whatever, wherever yeah. the format well, hey, is, you too. yeah, exactly. wherever the format is, like, that's what I'm after. And there's like, that's, I mean, the, the chat GPT, people probably argue with this. <laughs> <laughs> I do think that there is a moat there. And I do think that there is, uh, you know, value there. So that's why I continue to pursue it. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Well, and I mean, to be fair, there's plenty of people that, you know, I'll, this is going to sound again, maybe cold, but qualify from the fact that like you know they're just interesting intellectually and and we're sort of adjacent but i guess i do have friends where i like hanging out with them even though we're not in the same business so it's not like my whole social group is dictated by yeah you know like potential and and we need that people i'm trying to recruit or you know sell to i mean that's not everyone i talk to and even the people i'm trying to recruit or sell to i'm trying to build like a base friendship with not base is the wrong word i'm trying to build a friendship with 
Yeah. Like a genuine friendship that's based on, you know, who I, who I really am as a person. And, and that's, you know, one of the reasons I, I tend to be kind of blunt and, you know, maybe say things I shouldn't sometimes because I feel like it's a, just a quicker way to cut through the bullshit and, you know, like see if, you know, you're going to get along with somebody in the long run. And it's to let them who you know, know who you are on the front end. And it's a sustainable way to establish those relationships because yeah. if like all of a sudden you're going to introduce that year three after like three years of living a lot, like yeah. that's where that's where people have like you know relationships blow up and what have you. But yeah, for sure. Um, or like I mean, we've all hung out with people like this, and I, I find it repellent. But there's an attribute of, of people that I refer to as being penisy. Like me and a former business partner had this, and. Penisy in this case is a synonym for disingenuous. Right. And so, like, you can kind of tell people have, like, a high-pitched voice, you know, or, like, they'll sound like they're doing a character and you can't really tell if they believe the stuff they're saying themselves. Yeah. And, you know, that person's a penis. <laughs> and so yeah. it's like, I don't really want to hang out with penises. Yeah. Or peni, I guess. <laughs> the plural. Yeah. It's, it's disorienting. It's disorienting to realize that you're yeah. in their midst. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I try not to be that way, and I catch myself being a penis occasionally. I, I don't want to be one, but nobody's perfect, you know, and I, yeah. I'm like, yeah, don't act that way. <laughs> Just got to stay vigilant, always be on guard. Against, yeah. Against. yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's an easy trap to fall for if you start, you know, worrying too much about what people think of you or if you're trying to optimize for sales or whatever. I mean, it's it's easy to start behaving disingenuously and... I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's important to counteract that voice in your head. Otherwise, you can't form deeper relationships. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think if you start living your life seeing everyone as a mark, that's a problem. That's, yeah. that's a huge problem. And coming from finance, I can tell you, there are forces that push people in that direction that I'm yeah, sure. glad to have uh, moved away from. But what I've come to the belief, and this is just a belief, there's, there's no, I can't justify this. I've come to the belief that the best salespeople are occupying precisely the most authentic voice. I completely agree. And, and it's just like, I believe in this. Like, I genuinely believe that I have all the capabilities and all the willingness and, and desire to transform those hundred businesses with this video marketing through its implementation. And so it's not, it's no longer this pursuit of like, ooh, Got him. Like, 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 if after you sell someone, your thought is, got him. Yeah. That's a fucking that ain't good. That's huge like, problem. Yeah, you're working in a boiler room. And you're like, eh, look at this. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But it's like, okay, time to get to work. Or, okay, like, now I have, like, I have to deliver. Yeah, well, that's important, right? That's I mean, like, what it's all about. To, to not get complacent, you know, just because you closed a sale, like, with an account, I think is... You have to constantly remind yourself, for one, because it's it's a trap that, you know, is, I would say easy to fall into, but you can fall into the trap of being like, wow, we've been doing business with this client for so many years, and they're not going to fire us. It's like, well, don't think that way, because you're going to, yeah. your whole competitive edge is based on the fact that, you know, you're constantly trying to do the best job, and so, like, I think... I don't know. It's good to remind yourself of that. I'm yeah. glad you think that way too. Only the paranoid survive, right? What's the the guy from uh, was it Intuit who who said that? I've never heard that. That's oh. interesting. It's a old Silicon Valley leader guy. Now I'm Andy something. We're we're in the late stages of the podcast. Someone yeah, no will worries. drop it in the comments, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Send all hate mail to podcast at sk solutions. <laughs> yeah. So if you found this mildly enjoyable, I've also got a podcast. It's called Going Deep. Find it on all podcast players. Uh, my YouTube channel is my name, Aaron Watson. I am not the country singer. That's very important. There's Aaron country... Watson business. <laughs> yeah, Aaron Watson business, as you can tell from most of the stuff that was discussed today. That is the topic of discussion. And uh, if you run any sort of B2B service provider looking for video marketing help, Piper Creative can help you. Yep, and I'll be honest. I did find Aaron Watson, the country singer, when I was looking for you uh, earlier today just to kind of... yeah do my homework and, and watch some of your podcasts. I really, really enjoyed the podcast you did with Jonas. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it was, it was a fun piece of content. And that guy just seems like like a fun person to interact with and just, as you put it, very genuine. 
Absolutely. So. And and fun thing about the Aaron Watson phenomenon of him being the country singer is like every once in a blue moon, people will tag me when they're going to one of his concerts. <laughs> so there'll be like you know, like three girls in like cowboy you know apparel for a, a, a country concert, being like, can't wait to go see Aaron Watson. Like, let's have fun in there or something like that. That's it's, hilarious. It's, it's always a good time. My uh, my relatively smaller amount of following on Twitter always enjoy those retweets. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines, a contract engineering company that specializes in solving really, really difficult engineering problems. SKA Custom Robots and Machines. And subscribe if you listen this much and you enjoy this, please. <laughs> and comment and like and share it with a friend. Yeah, I, I never thought to say those things, but please do. That would be nice. Well, that's YouTube 101, baby. Like and subscribe. <laughs> like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> or I'll eat your soul. <laughs>